Prime Minister and Mayor of Japan. Please take your comments. Um, this is I think the biggest issue with the democratic age is the perception that anyone can do anything. Quite simply, from the opening government, we prefer a monopoly on journalistic authority for three reasons. Firstly, because we think it creates better and more accountable news. Secondly, because it means a better in, in engagement with news overall. And thirdly, because we think it better engages with bias within reporting overall. We think ultimately this is a debate then about how we perceive the role of journalism in society, and more particularly the role of journalists. What we tell you from the opening government is that the point at which we allow for the democratization to the point where people are unlikely to be paid, where they're unlikely to be professionals, and where we decentralize to the extent that we're likely to be getting most of our news from Twitter, we make news worse. And that poses existential threats to things like our democracy and the stability of our societies. Two arguments in my speech. One, we prefer this monopoly. Secondly, the lack of that monopoly makes journalism worse. Before that, though, a few questions of contextualization. Firstly, what do we think citizen journalism is? I think the first and most important thing to note is that it is on, most often than not, not paid. That is to say that for the most part, you are an unprofessional journalist actor who is reporting on decentralized sources such as YouTube, such as Twitter, such as Facebook. And at the very, at the very, very best, you sometimes become integrated or co-opted into formal journalist structures. That might look like lazy reporting where we collect a bunch of tweets and say, here's what's going on in Peas Must Fall, or it could go so far as to say that we're going to use this person and have like a single introduction of an op-ed, and then they're going to go back to their Twitter space. We think what is important there is to say that these people are not ingrained within the institutions of journalism. They are likely to be engaging in decentralized reporting that is, as a result, oftentimes way more difficult to regulate. Moreover than that, we would say that on either side, even if it is the direct use of a citizen, as in we are now putting you on The Guardian, or if it is the collection of citizen contributions and using them as the primary source, we think both are regrettable. The reason that this is important for the, uh, for the comparative is because it would be a soft line from opposition to say that this is the use of civilian sources. That happens in the status quo. What is specifically different and characteristic to civilian journalism is that they become the primary source, they become the mediator of the source, and they then report the information. We say we are happy to have civilians engaged in reporting. We interview people on the side of the road all the time. But at the point at which they constitute the journalistic authority that I am referring to, we think that there are specific mechanisms that won't be regretted. But more on that in a second. Secondly, when do we regret developments in journalism? Two things. Firstly, when it's just bad, right? So we can regret Russian state journalism for the pure reason that we think it is inaccurate and likely to be biased. Has nothing to do with whether or not we can access a variety of sources. If that source itself is bad, we think it's regrettable. But secondly, we regret um, the, the advent of a journalistic practice if we can prove to you that it makes journalism worse. And that's what I'm going to be doing in my speech, showing you specifically how the mechanism of civilian reporting undermines things like journalistic integrity and the reporting of accurate and, and, and sort of relevant news. We think all of this is important then because this debate is going to be won or lost based off of the characterization of how civilian journalists engage with journalism as a whole. What that then means is I need to do a final point of contextualization, which is what the role of journalism is within modern democratic society. Quite simply, journalism mediates between the state and the civilian. It exists to report on the activities of that state and ensure that the civilian who engages in an active democratic society is well informed enough to engage fairly. This is to say then that the role of journalism is to mediate between powerful structures and less powerful structures. 
But that does not necessarily mean that the way to mediate between those structures is powerlessness, is decentralization, and is atomization. In fact, we would say the easiest way to mediate through powerful structures is through other powerful structures. That's why, for example, we have a constitutional court to hold a country to account. We think the agglomeration of power, specifically when it comes to engaging with democratic structures and engaging with things that are relevant to our democracy, are particularly important. Why do we say that? First point of analysis then, preferring a centralized journalistic authority. We think the first reason for that is because the thing that is most essential to good reporting and a successful democratic society is regulation and accountability. I think it is fair to say that on either side, there is a likelihood for bias, right? On the opposition side, there is a likelihood for bias from state-owned news entities, from um, groups like ENCA or BBC News or Al Jazeera, who are all known to have their own sort of individual political biases. But what we say is on the comparative, on government bench, the sort of bias and lack of accountability that comes from mass decentralization is significantly more risky. This is to say that even if some bias exists on either side, the specific type of bias and the specific type of a lack of accountability that can exist with civilian reporting is dangerous. Why do we say that? Firstly, because they are unlikely to be subject to legal regulation. At best, the sort of backlash that you get when you report bias on Twitter is that your account gets blocked, right? We think comparatively, you are able to take journalists to jail. You are able to defund particularly corrupt journalistic entities, and as a result, there are more direct incentives to hold these people to account. This is made even more damaging with the characterization I tell you that says that most of these civilian journalists are rarely paid. This is to say we can't even use their financial interests as a mechanism to hold them to account. Whereas if I work for Al Jazeera, when I get fired, I lose my job, and so I'm going to be a better journalist, my Twitter account getting deactivated at best removes me from some monetization opportunities. We think on a scale of balance then, we think that there's more regulation both on legal, infrastructural, and financial means. Second level, we think that the quality of journalism is worse. This is to say that on average, the ability to receive journalistic training, to have your experiences be rooted in expertise, such as the political or economic sciences, is something that is important. We don't think it's fair or necessary for a government bench to do this whole la di da thing where we say that actually everyone has a right to be able to report, they all have an important lived experience. That's fine, that's an op-ed, go to Twitter and go on your like little Twitter spaces. When we speak about journalism, we think that there is an explicit benefit that comes from expertise, and that expertise ought to be prioritized. For the same reason that even though we would like all people to access free education, we recognize that people who have PhDs are relatively more experts in fields than people with high school degrees, we think a similar mechanism can apply here. We like democratization, but not when it jeopardizes expertise. Third level then, because we think that there is a necessary, uh, or that there needs to be a necessary resistance to information overload. This is to say that at the point at which reporting becomes so atomized, so decentralized, that every news item, every news event can become so big on these decentralized spaces, you're unable to prioritize important news. That means that news on regional levels are less likely to be reported to people through their regional gazettes because every, the only thing that's trending on Twitter is fees must fall. The reason that this is relevant then is because what I tell you the role of journalism is, which is to create informed democratic participants. At the point at which information overload, which is a natural thing that affects all humans, undermines our ability to engage with news meaningfully, we think that there's a regret. Finally, why do we think that this has made journalism worse? Firstly, because it pushes people away from real journalism. On average, it's easier to engage with tweets than it is with a long op-ed from Al Jazeera. The opposition bench might say that that's a benefit. We make news bite-sized, and that's great because it means people read the news. No, that's not true, right? We think that on average, we would prefer less accessible but more accurate news than inaccurate, more accessible news. This is because of the role of journalism within our society. Quite simply, panel, this is a debate about the role of journalism. We say expertise always trumps decentralization, side with the government bench.
it's funny that Dan claims that they are going to get more reliability. When Al Jazeera reported on the looting that occurred in Durban last July, they gave grossly inaccurate statistics. They told us that Indian people were being persecuted. And this is what's not the case, given that we were living in Durban. Al Jazeera is a normally reputable source, as they would like you to believe. But the issue is that these sources are prone to bias, but secondly, that the further away you are from a situation, the less likely you are to be realistic. Proximity is very important in the way in which we report news. Two things that, people, that they need to do in this debate in order to prove why we need to regret this, this form of citizen journalism. Number one, they need to show a moral harm. And number two, they need to tell us why it has a negative social impact. I'm going to deal with why they didn't do this efficiently later. What are we going to tell you about in this debate? A few things. Number one, I'm going to conversely tell you why we think we create better journalism. Number two, I'm going to tell you why closer proximity equals greater value. And number three, I'm going to tell you why the decentralization of information is something that is critically yeah. important. Yeah. Given that, no thank you, let's do some rebuttal. There's a few things that Dan comes up and tells us. Number one, that they prefer the idea of monopoly. Ladies and gentlemen, monopolies are bad for two reasons. Number one, because when you create a monopoly, you have less chance of holding them accountable. Okay. ESCOM has a monopoly over electricity in South Africa, and we can't hold them accountable and stop load shedding from occurring because of the monopoly that exists. I think that's a problem. But secondly, the reason why a monopoly is bad is because it creates a safe space which other people cannot interact with. Especially when it comes to news, which is things affecting each and every one of us and our daily lives, we all need to be able to interact with that particular safe space, and a monopoly right. prevents that safe space from existing. That's a problem. The next thing they tell us is that this, these individuals are somehow not paid. For shame, right? The reason why they're not paid is because they do it by choice. These citizen journalists opt into the, 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 the creation of a blog, knowing that they're not going to get paid from it. We don't understand the relevance of that particular yeah, point. Furthermore, they tell us that the role of journalism is merely to mediate the, the role between powerful and less powerful structures. No, let's look at it as a spectrum, because we think they have a grossly unfair characterization of what journalism ought to be. Yes, there are big powers that exist to mediate this between powers, powerful and less powerful structures, but journalism is also day-to-day -day reporting. The things that affect us as people in the country, the way that the floods affected us in KZN, that's okay. general reporting at what happened to my neighbor. These are important things because it affects the way I perceive my society and my surroundings. That is something that's crucial. I'll get back to that later. Furthermore, they tell us that you can't hold these individuals to account financially. So note the first response I gave about them doing this by choice. But secondly, right, even if, right, deactivating someone's yeah. Twitter account or blog is the highest form of accountability you could give them anyway. Because to someone who creates a blog knowing that this is their primary right. source of information, they obviously care about this blog and they care about the dissemination of information via this blog. Removing this blog is the highest form of accountability we can get for them. But furthermore, the accountability is good because it's personalized, because we know who is creating that blog and who is running it, and that is something that's also important. No, then. Yeah. Final thing they tell you is the idea of information overload, and apparently why this is something that's particularly bad. Information overload can only occur if we perceive that every piece of information is valid. We know that with citizen journalism, not everything is to be taken as fact. Some yeah, things yeah. are just to be taken as a perception of day-to-day -day life, right? We don't think it's an information overload because I am not perceiving every single thing I see on Twitter as something that's real and is therefore going to affect my life in the deepest way, right? Let's be re realistic about how we engage with these social platforms. Why is this rebuttal strategically important? Number one, because it tells you that they have a grossly unfair characterization of where this debate ought to occur. They need to expand it. But number two, it shows you that they haven't shown sufficient harm. We aren't really buying it in this debate. Cool. Please. No. Now, let's get on to some positive matter. The first thing I'm going to tell you is how it creates better journalism. Before this, a bit of context, right? In, in, and we would call this a more valuable context, a more kind context, a more expanded context, because Journalism and citizen journalism also includes things like all spheres of journalism. It includes your friends who write research papers, right, and you read these. It includes your friends who interview others and therefore write blogs thereafter, right? These, it's a wide spectrum of things that occur that we all are happy to include because we think there's no harm that comes from it. How does it create better journalism? Number one, under normal journalism, there's often a lack of objectivity 
in it, right? What do I mean by this? Because it is often subjective views that are presented in an objective manner, right? When I say objective, we mean when we see stats, when we see, see statistics, when we see facts, when we see numbers, we believe automatically that it's something that's real, that's true. If I have to tell you that there are 15% of people in like in this country who can't who live below the poverty line, it's like, yeah, right. man, they, maybe people live, maybe right. that amount of people live below the poverty line, right? Facts and numbers do this to us as humans, right? But importantly, these normal journalists are often influenced by sponsors. Example, SABC often underreported the, the, um, the role of Cyril Ramaphosa in the current corruption investigation right. with the Zondo Commission, right? These are things that occur because the SABC has a particular role and they know that they are linked to the South African government, right? These are important things that can occur, which are very right. problematic, ladies and gentlemen. We need to understand that, right? But furthermore, right, it's important to understand that these individuals, citizen journalists, they right. are not they, we know that they are not reputable sources, that's something that they, that's good, but comparatively, they are less likely to be biased to these major companies, right? Because they exist, I'll take you in a minute, because they exist in a individual uh, space, and right? we don't think that they're going to be linked to the South African government, yes? Okay, do you agree that actual journalists are in competition with citizen journalists? I don't think there's a competition. I think it's a space for everyone to exist together, and that is what we are arguing for. We're not arguing completely against normal journalism. It has its space. But we think citizen journalism also has a very valuable space, and all we need to show you is that it's a benefit of that space existing. Right. Given that, why do we think that um, closer proximity equals greater value? Right. Why is this particularly important? The further away from a source you are, the less reliable you are. Number one, because Oftentimes, your reporting or these apparent news outlets result or get the information from other sources, right? That is to say that they trust what someone said about it who is actually living in that particular country. Conversely, with citizen journalism, you are right next to the issue that has occurred. You have maybe even experienced it yourself. And that is why you are able to report on it better. Because you understand the true impact of what occurred. You understand that and you are able to disseminate that information to not just people around you, but people even on a global, global scale in a more accurate fashion. And that is important particularly because that can also occur, right? But also, Robert's going to come up and tell you why the decentralization of information is important. Ladies and gentlemen, we want a, this uh, citizen journalism to exist because we feel it has fundamental importance. It is not a model harm, but furthermore, we think there are benefits that come to, to the people who are journalists and the rest of society stand with all female opposition. They do it out of choice, right? And therefore, their views are going to be objective because they're so close. They're like they're in close proximity to the these uh, to the events of you know where news is happening. And so therefore, you know when they're closer, they actually have an accurate idea of what's going on. And therefore, you know they won't do, say things wrong, right? Firstly, what we say, well, that is one of their main arguments, right? And what we say to this, uh, yeah. So then they say, of in rebuttal to our case, they say, you know, you can, when we say you can, the worst you can do with them is deactivate their Twitter account. That is not enough to hold them accountable. And they say, you know, this is the, what, the best you can do to hold them accountable because you are, this is what they do. This is like their life, well, not their livelihood, but this is something that they choose to do and therefore it is, you know, deactivating their, their Twitter account is going to be enough, right? Uh, I'm going to yell that in rebuttal, but. Yeah, so I'm going to do some about some of my speech, and I'm going to be going into an argument about how this not only you know doesn't de doesn't uh, fix the harms of bias uh, bias reporting, but in fact worsens them. Uh, yeah, right. 
So on robots, that's enough. First, they say on the they do it out of choice, and so therefore they're not going to do it. They're not going to you know be subjective because they are affected by it and all of that. Right. Firstly, what we say is even in our case, even in that case, right, where these people are close in proximity, and so therefore they will give you know accurate an accurate representation. What we say, we actually deal with this PM to be in the PM to be because what he says is we still interview these people. We still get their opinions from, you know, yeah, get, these, get these people's opinions. And so therefore, we can sit down, we can get like an accurate representation of these people there. Right, secondly, they say, you know, deactivating their Twitter accounts is the worst you can do for them because this is something that they choose to do and therefore, you know, uh, they, they choose to do this. And therefore, deactivating it is a great harm to them. What we say is if you are fired from your job because you, you, like, you give the most inaccurate representation of, in a news article, right? Deactivating a Twitter account that you can remake and continue doing that is not the same. Because when you lose your job, you lose your livelihood. And therefore, you have an incentive not to, you know, not to uh, give subjective news, not to give objectively incorrect news. But you can do this in, you know, uh, in citizen journalism, right? So then, yeah, I'm gonna move on, right, onto my main argument about how not only does this not fix the harms of accountability in big companies, right, but in fact worsens it through, yeah, actually just worsens, right? So first, three, so there are three things that are important, right? So why there's even less accountability, why they encourage a lack of accountability, and how citizen journalists aren't going to take the time or the effort to learn how to be a journalist, and therefore are going to have, and also have less incentive to journal, to report well. So, why does it make it even worse? Because, no, why, 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 yeah, why does it make it even worse, right? Because journalists, they spend time learning how to be a journalist, right? They spend money going to you know, school to be a journalist. They have, an, they have a vested interest in being a good journalist because if they aren't, they're going to be fired. On the comparative, when a citizen journalist, when a citizen journalist, they're not, they don't go to school, right? They're, they don't go to school to be a journalist. They don't have a vested interest in it because they aren't going to lose their job if they, if they do, if they report badly, right? And they, you know, they have like a subjective opinion because they are a citizen journalist. Obviously, uh, you know, we accept that sometimes there are, you know, uh, so there are subjective opinions in journalism set down by, you know, big companies, right? But this is only going to be worse because these citizen journalists aren't going to be, be held accountable. Yeah, right? Then why is there even less accountability, right? Because when all of your news comes from unre you know, unaccount unregulated sources, right? When everybody, when there are like a hundred articles that are written, you obviously aren't going to read every single one of them because every single one of them is from you know some some like little journalist at his home writing you know writing some article, right? So when you see all of this, obviously you aren't going to be find, you aren't going to be able to find you know accurate news because everything is going to be written by some by a journalist who is at their home. And when the, as we've already proven, these journalists aren't going to be able to hold aren't going to be held accountable and therefore are going to you know, give less accurate news. So when you read all of this, there's one going to be information overload, as we said in the PMP, but two is going to be, you know, it's going to be, you're going to be able to find less true news. Sit down. Um, yeah. So then on the third point, you know, why citizen journalism is, you know, it encourages, you know, why citizen journalism is likely to be less accurate? Because, you know, citizens, they don't have this vested interest in being a journalist. They have other. They have an other, They have another livelihood, and you know they have. They have another livelihood, and so they do it out of choice, right? And if they have you know harmful opinions that you know that they want to spread, and they write a journal and they write an article because they are going to be held accountable for writing that for you know writing something inaccurate, and because you know we are encouraging on opposition side. All of these people writing this, you know, writing these articles, uh, writing these articles. Then obviously, when these articles aren't accurate, there's nothing they can do. Uh, yeah. So what have I done in my speech? 
I have done some rebuttal on the argument about you know social proximity. Actually, should extend on that. You know, there are news companies that you know do do like small like small time things, right? Like the Rosebank Gazette, you know, it will report on you know local things in Rosebank. So that thing about proximity, you know, doesn't really matter. And then I'll give you an argument about how this is not only going to decrease accountability, but it's also fundamentally going to change, you know, news 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 companies, news companies being less trusted, but it's also actually going to increase it and decrease accountability. Thank you. Thank you. government makes four strategic flaws that mean they can't face in this debate. First and foremost, they have an incredibly one-sided characterization of what citizen journalists are. Throughout the entirety of both of the speeches we've received, we've only received the characterization of the awful, the inaccurate, the citizen journalist that simply won't be able to do anything that's reasonable. What they needed to do to win this debate is to tell us why, even in the context where a citizen journalist is still providing accurate information, they're essentially fulfilling all of the obligations of what a journalist should do, that's still a regrettable thing. I get a lot of information from following Dan on Instagram and looking at his statuses as well. I don't think that he's unreliable. I do think I can get information from him. So they needed to defend that. Note, importantly, on our side, we deal with that negative characterization that they give us as well, that characterization of inaccurate news, that characterization of journalists not necessarily being professional, but I'll deal with that more further. Secondly, we don't have to defend um, one kind of news over the other. We already stated that A, preempting the extension we're going to get, they're not in competition, they can both coexist. As a matter of fact, I'm going to tell you in my speech why the existence of citizen journalism is somewhat helpful to the normal standard of journalism as well. Thirdly, we give, <laughs> thirdly, they simply straw man the case that we've given you. We don't think that we told you that just because you're on the ground level, you're more likely to be objective in all of the information that you bring. No, we don't think that's what we, we said. We said that because you're on the ground level, you are more likely to have more information than any other source because of a situation like that. We are really somewhat agreed that objectivity isn't something that can always be guaranteed. Fourthly, we just think that they don't have a fundamental understanding of the technology around citizen journalism, which is why most of my responses are literally just, no thank you, me going to be stating facts that already exist. So, the first thing that they give us here is the fact that there's less accountability with uh, citizen journalists because all you have to do is to deactivate your Twitter account, you can't be fired, you know, you can't be sent to jail, which factually is untrue. Information was even released in South Africa that if you are spreading false news about COVID-19, you could face criminal charges and go to jail. So if that is the maximum standard that you hold as accountability, clearly it exists, no thank you, to an equal extent on the outside. That being the first thing. Secondly, you are more likely and more able to hold a single individual accountable as opposed to a large corporation. The idea of power mediating power is exists in the fundamental absence of examples because they don't want to show you what that power mediating power actually look like, looks like. It looks like SABC being bankrolled by the government. Those are the two powerful institutions that are mediating each other. That's why they're always helping each other. That's why we're not hearing about Cyril Ramaphosa's involvement in the Zondo Commission. It looks like Al Jazeera being bankrolled by massive companies in the Middle East. That's why they underreport some of their atrocities as well. Comparatively, they can't win this argument because they haven't shown us 
why on a balance of probabilities you are more likely to hold an you are more likely to hold an institution accountable as opposed to an individual whose name you have and who exists on a social media platform. Second idea that we get from them is the idea that um, it's difficult to verify decentralized information on these social media platforms, which again. Technology is consistently evolving and these social media platforms are finding better and more impactful ways to A, spot inaccurate information, which is what Facebook is currently doing, even on TikTok, before you open a video, before it starts playing, it does warn you that the information you are about to consume may not be verified in cases where they've investigated that it's simply not true. This is why I said they really just don't understand the technology behind citizen journalism and that's going to cost them this quarterfinal. The third thing that they give us here is the idea that you no no thank you is that is the idea that you ought to have professionals disseminating information and they prefer information that is less accessible and is qualitatively better. Panel, this is intellectual elitism. Not everyone can a access those Al Jazeera articles or simply understand some of the lingo. And we think that the information that they give to society is something that they all have. So if I, as a person who understands it, has the ability to take that information and translate it in a way that could be understood by people in society, I'm doing an incredibly valuable thing and they must understand that as well. Fourth idea uh, that we get from them is the idea that we can still interview people, therefore our proximity argument doesn't stand because we'll still get accurate information. The problem here is this. You can still interview people and get their sides of the story, but what gets out to the public still relies on those very companies. And the nature of journalism is that it is incredibly narrative. You have to build a story, you have to tell a story, and that means you have to ultimately leave out some valuable information so it fits into the larger narrative of what you're trying to put forward. That's why we don't get the no, I... best information in this context, and it's comparatively better under our side. Yes, I'll take it. You can't straw man a whole OG case and expect to play it. What we told you is that comparatively, the accountability structures are less centralized and exist less. The fact that TikTok needs fact checkers is testament to the problem Sorry. that we regret. Sorry. Firstly, no. You needed to show you why comparatively those accountability structures do exist. We have seen people actually being sent to jail for spreading misinformation about COVID-19. Because we have a bit more information, because they don't have massive legal teams behind them, it's easier to hold them accountable. We don't think that you dealt with that under your side. We don't think you can win this debate by simply saying the word strong. That being said, two very valuable contributions that are coming from opening uh, opposition in this case. Firstly, we think we help the nature of normal journalism in itself under three levels. Firstly, people generally share links to these articles that drive traffic to these businesses, which generates more revenue for them in that case. But secondly, there's an increase in intellectual engagement with a lot of these reputable news sources. And thirdly, as Dan already said, sometimes they co-opt these student or these citizen journalists into their own mainframe to also provide them with information. So really, we think even in the best case scenario, where they want normal journalism, on the outside, we still help it, we amplify it, we make it better. But also, why do we think that the very nature of information is important? We ought to have information people can access, information that they don't have to pay for so that they can act on it on their day-to-day -day lives. That is what is important in this debate. Strategically, we are better than open in government because we look across the spectrum and we still show you why we give a better comparative. But secondly, even if we did nothing, we still show you why A, there's no competition between nominal journalism and student journalism, and we help the very kind of journalism that they want side of the open opposition.
what are you going to get from side closing government? We're going to characterize what who citizen journalists actually are, right? Because we got a really cool characterization from opening opposition telling you that citizen journalists are objective and accurate and close to the situation. Sure, maybe some of them are, but the vast, vast, vast majority are not. We're going to give you a much more accurate characterization. Secondly, we're going to characterize journalists and how citizen uh, uh, journalists actually affect journalists and make journalists a lot worse by making uh, journalists sink to the level of uh, citizen journalists. But thirdly, we're going to characterize what people actually read online these days, what journalism actually looks like, right? Because journalism truly, the vast majority of what we read, 90% of the articles that we read online, is not like very well-researched, accurate things about the floods uh, or, or the uh, looting in Durban. It's actually political pieces. It's actually uh, things that polarize people immensely. The stuff that we read online um, is not like well-reported uh, things on Twitter. It's like uh, like alt-right, conservative, anti-feminist things, or politically polarizing opinions. Those are the three things that we're going to get you, right? Just quickly, how are we different, distinct, and more valuable than OG? They told you that like uh, uh, journalism is good, uh, better than, than citizen journalism, because it has, uh, citizen journalism has a lack of accountability, lack of legal regulation, and they have biases and so on. But we tell you, uh, like, we, we give a much better characterization of what citizen journalism actually is, and we tell you with mechanisms what makes, uh, how citizen journalism makes journalists worse, right? And then I'm going to not give explicit rebuttal because my characterizations are going to clash directly with the characterization of OO and tell you why their characterization, that's at the foundation of their very speech, uh, their whole case does not work at all and how we flip their characterization completely. So what does OO tell you? They tell you that these people are incredibly accurate, um, like uh, they're very close to the situation um, and so on. We think that sure, sometimes this is true, but maybe like 5% of the time. Like it's a very specific niche characterization that's very unstrategic and has lost them their debate, right? So what does like uh, online journalism actually looks like? And this characterization feeds into the two extensions that we have, firstly on political polarization, and secondly about how you make journalism work. No, thank you. So, um, realistically, what are, are citizen journalists? There is, these are people on Twitter, right? These are people on Twitter that like uh, uh, post things and get tweets. The problem is human beings, like we all want attention. We all want people to listen to what we're saying. Like we all want people, we want fame, we want clout, right? But before citizen journalists, they were checks and balances to make sure that like people wouldn't just lie with their information, right? There were various systems in place to make sure that people on Twitter couldn't just say anything or say racist things or make bold claims uh, and not be checked. Unfortunately, with citizen journalism, all those checks and balances are gone because of OG's mechanisms, but also because of the mechanisms that we give you, right? So what does this actually look like? This looks like people on Twitter going to a Black Lives Matter protest and saying, oh no, the Black Lives Matter protesters were like shooting white people or vandalizing things that they didn't vandalize. Citizen journalists has no accountability mechanism to take them out of it. That's the vast majority of online content and online journalism. It's not just stuff about uh, uh, the floods in Durban. So, so they can lie incredibly easily. So I'm going to give you now as a quick actor's uh, contrast, right? The difference between the incentives of journalists and the difference between the incentives of citizen journalists. So journalists have two things uh, that they have. They want promotions in their publications. So if they work for, for a newspaper, they want promotions. But they also want to win things like Pulitzer Pula Prizes. And they want reputation within their industry. So they have those incentives to do good things. Secondly, they have things like, uh, like uh, there's a principle in journalism, you need like two sources, otherwise you can't report a story. Also, uh, like you need a balance, right? All like, even if you're a very biased uh, publication, major newspapers need to have a balanced story. I'm going to contrast this traditional journalist with actual uh, uh, citizen journalists. These people have none of these things, right? Their only vested interest is in getting as many clicks and as many views and as many retweets as they can. That's the difference. They don't care about being promoted or getting a Pulitzer Prize or having as many sources uh, or having a balance. They just want clout. They just want fame, right? So we don't think that OO's characterization is fair at all. It's actually completely inaccurate, right? Um, and for that reason, we think they're completely out of the debate. So, quickly then. Um, we think the difference is that traditional journalism fo focuses mostly on very large impacts, right? We think that p places like the New York Times want the truth to be spread, even if it's boring. Climate change is quite boring, but the New York Times houses uh, well-researched information about climate change or uh, race relations. 
we think that citizen journalists have incentives to not do large impacts. They're things to uh, like write very sensationalist topics, have a lot of clickbait. They want to go viral. They want clout. That is their incentives. Contrast that to traditional journalists. This means two things, right? Firstly, it means political polarization. A quick context here. Currently, our political climate is incredibly polarized. It's aggressive. There's a lot of hate on the other side, right? But because we live in such a polarized society, we need negotiation between people, right? But a uh, citizen journalist uses uh, uh, like these, uh, uh, like this platform that they have to weaponize incorrect political information, right? So this is how conspiracy theories are spread. This is how like anti anti feminist theories are spread because there's no checks and balances to citizenship because they can only run sensationalist news. The second impact is that there's a demonization of the media. Every, everyone thinks that the media is a lot of fake news, right? People hate journalists, trust them less. That's our impact. But also mass political polarization. What's our second extension? Why is it incredibly important? So we've already told you how citizen journalists are, are chasing sensationalism, clickbait, and wanting to go viral. This necessarily makes traditional journalism a lot worse. So traditional journalists now have to compete with uh, citizen journalists. So traditional journalists now have to be equally sensational, have to be equally clickbait. Previously, the New York Times would have to spend two weeks writing an op-ed or researching an article. But now citizen journalists can report on something in an hour, the New York Times is forced to do that as well, right? Because they have to compete to that level. That's why things like the Daily Sun and tablets are a lot more popular today uh, because uh, journalistic uh, places that actually spread stories that matter are struggling to compete because people don't care as much as they do because of uh, uh, citizen journalism. So it makes journalism worse because there's more sensationalism, there's, le there's less research, there's less fact checking, and there's a lot more political polarization. We give you two unique harms. It makes traditional uh, journalism work. There's a lot more political polarization because people can just go to a Black Lives Matter protest, lie, and there's absolutely no consequences at all. For those reasons and those two harms, uh, we're very proud to propose. Thank you. A number of things that you're going to get in this speech. Firstly, what has led to the rise of citizen journalism? Because we think that citizen, citizen journalism in and of itself fills a certain gap that society has felt between themselves and naysayers. This this gap that society has felt between themselves and media 24. We think that there exists a certain gap, right? And citizen journalism has risen to fill that particular gap. But from and about that, right? Let's look at like the media in and of itself, right? Outside of journalism or journalism as a part of media. Panel, realize there's a reason why the media is called the fourth estate within like um, our conceptions of the modern state. And that is number one. Media drives narratives in society, right? That is why today, like most people just think like um you know, if, even though Cyril Ramaphosa was deputy president during the nine listed days of Jacob Zuma, he's not responsible for that. The particular, like, um, the particular motivating factors or the funders of these huge media companies, because there's a certain narrative that they want to push on society, not now, right? Because there's a certain, like, 
narrative that they want to push on society. And because there's this monopoly that side opening government consists to, we think that monopoly in and of itself is problematic. Why is that so? On two levels. Firstly, realize that they drive me, they drive like narratives that literally dictate policy and how we interact as society. And we think that because like there is usually one or two like huge um, media companies, the interests of those media companies are so narrowed down. And because like three families can control the narrative on 90% of South Africa, we think in principle that in itself is something that we shouldn't value, right? Fair and fine. They say that like um you can have like um you can, like very few people um, or rather very few um citizen journalists are actually like um you know they are actually objective. We say even if that was the case, panel, we say that even if only two out of ten citizens journalists are objective, we value them as an actor within society. Because number one, they fill in that particular gap that society fills between themselves and neighbors, that society fills between right. themselves and media 24. All and above that panel, we tell you from closing opposition that it is far much better, like you get better forms of accountability on these individuals for two specific reasons. Opening, opening opposition tells you that look, you, you have an individual that you can like straight up prosecute, you can block their Twitter account. Open the bar that from closing opposition, we say because these individuals like most of their like uh, most of their material is consumed within the, the within the larger society. That is to say, when Peter Rambetti goes on Twitter and says that there is a woman who gave birth to ten babies, Twitter can say, "Ah, hey, man, this doesn't sound right." And there is a, there is a conversation around that. But over and above that, the big media companies right. that exist in the status quo can call Peter Rambetti to check. Right within that, there is like there is a sort of like there is huge forms of accountability. There is huge ways of holding these citizen journalists accountable. Panel, what have you gotten from us from closing up that already sets us apart from our opinion? Firstly, realize that in principle we think that we value if, even if it's only one person who is objective out of ten, we value them, right? Because they are feeling a particular gap. But over and above that, it is because those other nine people can be held to account by the existing media are uh, like the huge media companies and also can be held to account by like Twitter in general, yes. right? But before I move on, I'll take it down. In the first 30 seconds of my speech, I conceded to all of the harms on the opposition bench. What I told you, which has not been engaged with yet, is that you need to prove that that one in 10 objective person fills that gap so much that it justifies decentralization. Until you do that, this is a government. Fair and fine. Realize, Panel, that there is one thing that entire government has failed to concede to in this debate, right? We think that podcasts are coexisting with radio. Right? Twitter is coexisting with the Times and the Sunday Times and like the Mail and Guardian. The importance of this particular piece of context is to say this exists within the same playground, right? This like they are competing within the same sort of playground. Why is that in particular important? There is no replacement. That is to say, citizen journalism isn't replacing your mainstream journalism. It is calling your mainstream journalism to check. That is to say, people in Twitter can say, no, this is not what Operation Tudula is about. You're, sens you're sensationalizing Operation Tudula. This is what Operation Tudula is to the people on the ground. Why is that important, right? Like, realize, panel, that, like, first of all, the Sunday Times determines what's the biggest story of the day. Why is that in particular problematic? Even if you can call the Sunday Times to account, even if you can help, even if you can like force them to apologize, the problem is the apology isn't as loud as the disrespect, right? At best, what you get is them are like apportioning just a corner of that page and saying, look, we published the story yesterday, which wasn't actually true, we are sorry. We don't think that is particularly enough as a form of accountability. We tell you that existing forms of accountability on these huge media companies isn't enough for us to, isn't enough to balance out the scales. What have you gotten from closing opposition? First idea, there is a gap that exists. Even if only one person is objectively feeling that particular gap, we value them. Because the, the, he, here, panel, let's look at like um, the, 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 the counter, like, okay, what does the world without these individuals look like? There is that particular gap. Number two, Nespas and Media24 can tell you that 
Cyril Ramaphosa is a good person. That is why you have a motion of no confidence on the cabinet and not a motion of no confidence in the president themselves. We think that the, the, the motivating factors behind these huge media companies means that as society, we need to have a counter narrative against that. Whether it's, it's right or it's wrong, we don't care, panel. It calls them to check. If it's wrong, fair and fine. Twitter will call you to account. If it's wrong, you can prosecute the person. But we think that like these individuals feel a, 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 like a vital part of like modern democratic society. How? Why is our case, or, or rather, like how do we weigh up against our opening? Realize, opening tells you that like um there is no like um these individuals will not replace traditional media. Closing up mechanizes that data, shows you how that plays out in the real world. But over and above that, we engage on the major principle of this debate, right? That is to say, these people exist to fill a certain gap. And whether it's one person or it's 10 people filling that gap, we value those individuals. We don't think it's regrettable. Proud of it. Paradox of our time is this. There are more elections than ever before, yet the world is becoming less democratic. The problem in uh, status quo is that the vast majority of journalists right now have to pander to people, and the best way they can do that is by acting like um, citizen journalists. They have to adopt the same mechanisms. And the consequence of that is that information, broadly speaking, ends up being worse for the majority of people. There are two central contributions that we provide as closing down. The first is to explain why it is there are stronger motivations to be accurate if you are um, a journalist, and those things would likely be stronger in the counterfactual. So what I mean by that is, if we live in a world in which there was not a rise in uh, citizen journalism, it is likely that the journalists would be more accurate in terms of the information they provide. And secondly, under their context, political polarization gets significantly worse. Now, what I want to do to be clear in the first be uh, beginning parts of my speech is explain why the impact of political polarization should outweigh all of the contributions you've heard so far. Then the second thing I want to do is engage directly with closing government, and then what I'm going to do is also engage with um, um, opening opposition. Yeah, we're closing government. Um, closing opposition, then we're going to deal with opening opposition. So why should you care more about political polarization over every other contribution in this debate? So we think it has a more tangible harm to citizens in general, right? Irrespective of whether or not you're a journalist. So the scope of the harm is much larger in comparison to the scope of the harm that was discussed in the opening half. So what is political polarization? And why is it likely to exist as a consequence of these uh, uh, citizen journalists? Right? So firstly, what we need to do here is give you that characterization that Frankie provides. So Frankie explains to you why. Citizen journalists are just people with their political biases, right? And they want to disseminate their political biases in order to score points within their input, right? They want to score points with conservatives, to make conservative points more prominent within that society. They have a strong incentive to demonize the opposition, right? And the consequence of that, there's more political polarization and animosity between people, right? Now, why should we care about that? 
So we think if you have more, a more polarized society, that's where you have less negotiation, less cooperation between people, and that's where, crucially, that's where you feel uh, that there's a much larger justification in being hostile to the other, um, to the other side of the political, to the political spectrum that believes in you. So the consequence of that is that the policies in that society are likely to be more, um, more uncompromising, unyielding. They're less likely to have concessions under their side because people are less likely to negotiate and the consequence of that is that you have societies in which people do not negotiate. Why is that bad given today's society? I think the vast majority of democracies in status quo are multicultural. There are a variety of people who believe in different things, uh, who have different political ideologies, and the only way they function is that there is a, a belief that we ought to cooperate in order for all of this to benefit. That is completely eroded under their context, given the fact that these, the primary means by which people get information is from people who have an incentive to demonize the other side, or who have an incentive to ensure that their side gets more points and more um, prominence. Notice if you're a journalist, a trained journalist, you're trained to limit the influence of your bias, right? So bias exists under both sides. At least under our context, there are pre-existing mechanisms for you to try to contain the influence of your bias when it comes to the news you're reporting. So that's the first reason why I think we're winning. The second reason why we're winning is because of the, the idea we have about competition between journalists and um, uh, citizen journalists. Because so, and this also directly engages with closing opposition. So closing opposition had this point about how you need a gap, right? I mean, this fills in a gap. We think that gap is there for a reason, and we think it's good for that gap to be there. The reason why that gap needs to be there is because you need there to be a period of time in which journalists are trying to confirm the accuracy of the information they're providing. But if you don't, if you now fill that gap, these journalists have an incentive to report things immediately. That's why, for example, opening opposition's um, uh, example of the full stats they get from Al Jazeera ACBC is precisely because of the presence of these uh, journalists, these uh, citizen journalists. These major, uh, these major news media companies like CNN or like ACBC, like ENCA, they're going to be more ineffective because they have to compete with citizen journalists who are, who are disseminating information right now, whereas if those citizen journalists did not exist, you, have, you would have more, in, more of a period of time, more of an opportunity to fact check yourself to make sure that the information you disseminate is better. Now, the other reason why I think our extension is important is because I think we give you a more plausible uh, characterization of the incentives of these uh, actual journalists. So let's be clear, opening government's incentives are that, like, if you are a journalist, you don't want to lose your job. We think there are stronger motivations that we explain that they ignore. So first is the idea that you want to prestige, right? The idea that you want to get a Pulitzer Prize. That's a very strong motivation for you to want to be accurate. The second is reputation within journalists, right? You want to be seen as the one who sticks out out of the other journalists. So you have a, a broader incentive for you to be more accurate in the dissemination of information. And lastly, it's the idea of getting promotions, right? The promotions and, and, and seeking like a greater standard of living. These are stronger motivations to be accurate, and we think they supersede the analysis that you get from um, opening up. Now, what I do is like more direct engagement with um, the other side. So let's first start with uh, closing government. You can't say closing government. Um, closing opposition and why we think their contributions weren't as important. So the first thing they they said, okay, I already dealt with the part about like um, citizen journalism filling a gap. The other thing they were saying is the idea of accountability, right? The idea that you could be, you know, Twitter can remove your account so you can get arrested. Well, the first thing that this is remarkably uncomparative, right? Because actual journalists are subject to the same accountability methods. So we think it's even better on our side because you can have your Twitter account removed, you can get arrested, plus you have ICASA monitoring you and making sure that you are not um, disseminating false information. So we can co-opt all of the mechanisms of accountability along with the mechanisms that we have on our side. So now let's deal with them opening up because I only have about a minute now. So the first thing is monopoly is bad. So we say monopoly in this instance is good because yeah, that means yeah. this monopoly is the type in which we are being very selective and gatekeeping about the accuracy of the information being disseminated, right? If you don't gatekeep accuracy, that's more likely, it's more likely that you're gonna have bad information sitting through the cracks. Right? The other thing is the idea of better journalists, that they lack objectivity. Again, this is completely um, uncomparative. Firstly, these, these companies are more heavily regulated. But secondly, right, people will have more heightened biases in the absence of being trained on how to not be biased. Right? Under their side, you have more of a strong incentive to post, for example, when it's a protest, the parts of the protest that align with your political leanings and ignore the parts of the protest that are inconvenient to your political side. That means more people only get one-sided forms of information because those are the sides that end up benefiting your 
benefiting you more than everyone else. Okay, what should you believe at the end of the speech? Two things. The first thing is that you have stronger motivations to be accurate in the absence of citizen journalists, and political polarization is the worst impact that is likely to happen as a consequence of these citizen journalists, and we avoid that by not having them exist in our counterfactual. <laughs> But not this. The accountability that comes from those in opposition is not necessarily on the type of news. Because we think this thing happens to fall. We think on site government, when people create bad news, those same mechanisms happen also on our side where those people get checked. So you don't think they can like run away with that. But understand the important mechanism that comes from us that beats our opening and beats them. The accountability mechanism on how a name tells you how one we use the whole public, like everyone is a fact checker. Understand. The mechanism you get on op from opening opposition from opening opposition on this are based on the fact that that news is harmful, that is when they arrest you. Our mechanism not only looks at news being harmful, but news in general, which is bad. Because some bad information may not lead you to being arrested, but it may simply become bad. The ability, the accountability mechanism to present from how society and like different people in social media and like in society like check that uh, check that news presents a better mechanism because at that particular point that is a form of regulation and a stronger form of regulation because whether the news is hate speech whether the news is bad speech we cover it all in our spectrum whereas on their particular side they don't. But secondly, on accountability mechanism is idle competition. I really think it's not justified. Why? The idle competition is that you're going to make this big companies like are less effective. This is so unrealistic for two levels. One, they have so many resources more than these citizen more than like citizen journalists. That is to say, they have so many resources to invest in lots of things. It's so unrealistic that a one James who's a citizen journalist is going to affect Al Jazeera because he's a white person. We think that is something unrealistic that comes across the government and makes them lose on the idea of competition. But secondly, the idea of competition actually benefits us because this is this. When big, big, big media companies have competition from these smaller companies, they are more incentivized to pump in more resources to better those news outlets. We think our our side, why we don't you make that it betters them because at the end of the day, that competition becomes so beneficial for them in terms of the amount of resources they put into this particular stuff. But secondly, there is this mischaracterization that the incentives of of citizen journalists are only like for clout and stuff like that. But understand why the incentives on like side closing governments, like side closing government of their houses is bad. People only want to make money. So regardless of how your information affects society, so long as you're getting your paycheck, you're going to like keep on putting up that news. The benefit on our side is that citizen journalists don't only come up to like get they don't want money. But secondly, many of them come up to rectify the problem within so their society. That is why they come up and put out that news. We think that is a far better alternative because they are not money driven and they're like driven to like create social change in those particular spectrums. So you think that is like in terms of accountability, I think that settles why we particularly think that, that I need accountability. But essentially, what comes from closing opposition is this. Media houses, big media houses, dictate the news that people receive. Why we don't regret citizen journalism is that citizen journalism breaks that monopoly of what news is within society. We right. think that is a far much important thing because when you dictate what happens in news, understand, 
Big media houses are funded by private individuals, but secondly, they are vulnerable to state influence. That is, the political polarization happens more on their side because you don't want to use you don't want to lose your license, so you're not going to report on how like the bad the president was. So you think in terms of accountability, they lose in their own like in, 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 their, 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 sorry, their own analysis. But like the other thing that you get from them, uh, especially closing government, is confusion. But I'm able to show you why that confusion is not necessarily bad, but actually it benefits media houses. But secondly, that confusion also goes in the best interest to like better how news is produced. Because if you're all competing, you're more incentivized to do this business. But secondly, statistics are also available to citizen journalists, so it's unrealistic to say that they're always going to produce bad news because they still have the same access to those particular resources. But like, I'll come back to CG. But OG, OG say that there's like, the explicit benefit of trying to make money becomes like good for them. But I show you why the incentive of you wanting to make money becomes harmful because you don't care about how this affects society, but you care more about them, like about about like the paycheck at the end of the day. But secondly, you talk about this idea of overloading, and it's their strongest idea. Why do you think it's better on our side? One, we think that overloading becomes good because media houses already dictate what you're supposed to listen to. That is to say, even the small but critical problems are never going to be listened to. So you think citizen journalists bring up the small but real challenges people face within society and allow them to be addressed on a bigger spectrum. That is to say, minority groups who are like suffering at a lower level are going to be hard because citizen journalists then put out that information. But secondly, these people also help less fortunate. So this is the time. So in terms of why. Overloading provides better awareness rather than creating a monopoly or a small or a short passage of us getting that particular information. That is why their case loses. Because they support monopoly, which one, and then they show you is bad. Because at the end of the day, the news you produce is only dictated as to what the people finding you want you to put out there. So I believe you're more influenced. On our side, no one is influencing us. All this influencing us, which becomes right. better, that we are influenced by wanting to help our community because people inherently are suffering with those particular communities. But secondly, the accountability mechanism or how there's not existing regulation is answered in my first in the, the first thing that in my speech. Also, a video on why our mechanism is the most important mechanism in this particular debate because it covers a large spectrum, unlike what you get from OG. That mechanism that people can act as fact checkers as citizen journalists relies on an unfair characterization of citizen journalists. We think people can comment on News 24 articles and call out the same level of bias. 15. Why specifically citizen journalists are the mechanism you defend? Understand, big corporations, editors exist. They are fact checkers. We think it is unrealistic for them to say that in citizen journalism, we can't have people who are checking those facts. Yet even when that information is passing through big media houses, you have to pass checking. We think it is unrealistic for them to assume that. But secondly, understand, even when you don't believe that, there is a network of citizen journalists who ensure they, they want to create credibility for themselves and let people see them. The, I, the, the, the need and desire to create credibility for themselves makes them do better research to provide for their particular audiences. So this is the thing. O OG's idea of overloading information, I show you why it is better now, because it creates better awareness for people to make better decisions. But secondly, the idea of regulation is answered by the accountability mechanisms we give you from side closing opposition. Uh, and when we look above our, our, our opening, is like what Amelia tells you. Our accountability mechanism, which is the central part of this debate, covers a larger spectrum in terms of fact-checking, in terms of accountability, because society itself, you, me, all of us in this room, can critique that news regardless of whether it's bad or harmful. We think that is a far better accountability mechanism. When we talk about CG, what CG is this. CG talk about competition. Show you why that competition is good and why it's not going to polarize, why it's not going to like, become bad to be the house. They have resources to do all these things. But the last thing as to why we rank above them, so political polarization happens more in us in their side because when you're citizen, when you're citizen journal, journalist, no one is funding you. You're doing these things for your own. So you're only promoting your interests and incentives. Their, their side becomes bad. What's CEO?